The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Every U.S. president since John F. Kennedy has utilized the Office of the National Security Advisor to formulate, implement, and manage national security policy. How have the president's varying interests, personalities, preferences, and experiences shaped their use of national security advisors, and how successful have the resulting policies been? Joining us to discuss the interrelated roles of presidents and their national security advisors is Matt Destler, professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and author of In the Shadow of the Oval Office, Profiles of the National Security Advisors and the Presidents They Served, from JFK to George W. Bush. And now, Doug Besherov. Uh, Mac Dessler, welcome back to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Happy to be with you again. Well, this is a continuing conversation. Uh, about the funnest read I've had in years, and for a serious book. You just made my day. Oh, good, and um, uh, on a tremendously important topic, uh, I really mean it. It's called In the Shadow of the Oval Office, Profiles of the National Se uh, Security Advisors and the Presidents They Served, from JFK to George W. Bush, and that's about the wordiest part of this book. It's, it's, a, it's a great book. Uh, Let's spend our time together talking about the other side of the coin, and that is how the president's interests, personality, experience uh, shape how they use the National Security Advisor. Uh, and you know my favorite way to start on this is um, Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, because as I read the passages in your book about him, I kept thinking, Supreme Allied Commander, everything lined up. Military people like to have a clear staff structure and clear lines of authority, and they see this as indispensable. And Eisenhower sought to organize his administration very much like that. Is that good or bad? In Eisenhower's case, it was mostly good. He, uh, he had, on the one hand, he had he said, my cabinet people are my action officers, therefore my Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, will be my principal person for foreign policy. And I will defer to him on many cases, even if I think I know the issues just as well as Foster. Now this changed pretty remarkably under John Kennedy. It changed in several respects under Kennedy. Eisenhower was ready to have a structured formal planning process, and he sat in on many, many National Security Council meetings. You give a figure of 90% of them. 90% of them, and he, they came once a week, and they would meet for two hours, and they would look at rather elaborate policy papers, which the staffs had, of the greatest departments had pulled together under his National Security Advisor, Cutler, and the cabinet would argue them, and the president would listen, and they might make decisions. Now, what, give us a, a flavor of what one of those topics might be, and then also whether you think that was a useful uh, um, allocation of the president's time. Well, the two, the two contrasts were they might have a you know, U.S. policy toward Burma or something like that, which would be you know, just one single country, not the most important. The other side was something they called bean soup which was basic national security policy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he got the acronym Bean Soup. And that was large principles that should govern the United States dealing with the world. Most people thought that Bean Soup, well, maybe a useful argument, was too, at too general a level to be very helpful in specific decisions. Except I'm struck sometimes that we want presidents to have a very broad view yeah. of the world and to apply ideas and yeah. lessons from different parts of the world. That's true. We do want presidents to be broadly educated. There are different ways of doing this. I would say that this was not an ideal way, but it was a way. 
And Eisenhower was serious about it, and it was a way he was comfortable with. Now, it's almost, um, it seems that the kind of time Eisenhower spent on this might be almost impossible to do in the modern media-oriented presidency because um, I took a look at uh, the schedules of past presidents over the last uh, few years just before coming in here. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of time, you know, standing next to a turkey. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and so there, there isn't the same quiet time to that go play be, golf yeah. and so forth. Yeah, because Eisenhower got a lot of flack yes. for playing golf. And, uh, and the other thing Eisenhower did was, while he had this elaborate planning process, he also had his own aide, General Andrew Goodpaster, who handled his day-to-day -day stuff, who got almost no publicity. Eisenhower never talked about him. He always talked about this broad National Security Council process. And everybody thought, well, he's crazy. Why does he, why does he do this national broad process? Whereas, in fact, Eisenhower was keeping on top of things through Andy. And, and good pastor, if I remember correctly, uh, was not just a soldier, but he was a soldier diplomat. Wasn't he NATO commander? He was later to be NATO commander. But he was, he was a very competent, very confidential staff aide. He handled intelligence issues. He handled a ra range of things. Eisenhower said every man would want his son to be, grow up to be like Andy Goodpaster. So John Kennedy seemed to have little patience, you know, reading your book, little patience in, uh, uh, for the Eisenhower process. In fact, I got the impression when I read your book that he thought it was Boring. He did think it was boring, and Kennedy was not going to be the person who was going to sit down at a, t a National Security Council meeting for two hours every week unless he was really engaged with the subject. Kennedy was not alone in thinking the process was boring, by the way. A lot of experts had came together and reached similar conclusions in the late 1950s, and Kennedy picked this up. But Kennedy's style was to be direct, to be, you know, he, w he was very intellectual, very interested in the issues, mm -hmm. but he wanted cryptic, he wanted uh, direct information, short questions, short answers, I'll ask another question if I want more information, thank you very much, but don't lecture me. Now, this is a touchy question. The, especially the early period of the Kennedy administration was pretty rocky from the foreign policy point of view. I think many people think either mistakes were made or just unfortunate turns of events. Let me ask you whether the lack of a planning process had some effect on what happened. And I'm thinking of everything from meeting with Khrushchev to the Bay of Pigs to um, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, I think the Bay of Pigs was the clear one where it could have well have made a difference. If you'd had a more structured, organized debate, it's hard to believe they would have ended up with a plan which, in retrospect, could not possibly have worked. It they apparently didn't even get a formal green light from the uh, Joint Chiefs. Well, they did get the Joint Chiefs to study it, but they didn't. But Kennedy wasn't that didn't push them hard enough, and so the Joint Chiefs naturally sort of said, "Well, that's an agency thing. We won't interfere. We'll just sort of bless it lightly." And then they went on. And because it was a very open, fluid process, uh, Bundy was not, at that point, didn't have quite the mandate to really demand that all these people come together and structure the issue, right? And he didn't uh, do it enough. And so, it, so things slipped through. It was, I think uh, the Khrushchev thing probably would have happened anyway. I'm not sure they think a formal process. And the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, by contrast, I think was extremely well managed, was very carefully done, and uh, the... Uh, Bundy played an important role. Uh, Bobby Kennedy played, his president's brother, played an important role in helping structure the debate. Uh, they had the luxury of having a week, essentially, to have the senior officials of the government meet together hours every day, sometimes with the president, often not, and sort out, figure out what our choices were, and to be able to do this in secrecy. In, in your book, you're ambivalent about Bundy's role through that process. Tell us about it. Well, I think on balance, Bundy played a useful role, but it was, we report that it was criticized because people said he was jumping around, that he didn't take a single position, that one day he was for negotiating, one day he was for an airstrike, one day he was for a blockade. And that was literally true, if you read the record. 
there's some evidence that Kennedy wanted him to take minority positions, to be sure that different positions That were the B standing. team was represented. Yeah, to be sure that they didn't come to a group think too early, and that Bundy, in, and Bundy in his own retrospective explanation says, there was really nobody the president respected who was on the bombing option. So I thought I ought to get on it and work it out with Maxwell Taylor, who actually the president did respect, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Maxwell Taylor, but nobody else he respected, and make the best we could of mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. he said we weren't really able to do that very well. Um, you've called Nixon a most peculiar president. Yeah, this was a politician who essentially hated people, or hated most people, who was incredibly suspicious, incredibly insecure. Um, when he would give a press conference, uh, Kissinger would feel obligated to call him afterwards and to tell him exactly how great and how wonderfully he had done, not offer him advice about how he'd do better next time, but how great he'd done to, to sort of shore him up, to give him to be back his confidence. Uh, but that's the negative side of, of yeah. Nixon, and, and for sure it's a deep, dark side. Yeah. Um, but you also seem to characterize Nixon as intelligent and well-informed, and I think you, in our first show, you credited him with knowing what to what he wanted in China and Russia, perhaps before Henry Kissinger. So there's another side of Nixon here. That is right. And Nixon was a very thoughtful, very substantive person who had very clear policy ideas. Um, Almost uniquely among presidents, he came into office with this, both a strong foreign policy background and a real sense of directions that he wanted to go in. And uh, Kissinger was, importantly, his agent. It's a mistake to think that he was just the president sitting on top and Kissinger was thinking of everything and doing all the substance. Kissinger did do a lot of the details because Nixon didn't like to do details. But Nixon did do purpose. He did broad purpose, and he was stubborn about it, even if it didn't have political support. In fact, part of the problem, big problem with Vietnam, where a lot of people opposed his not getting out of Vietnam fast enough, he then, uh, it's because Nixon is determined to do it his way, that he thinks is the right way. Now, in the 50s, in the early 60s, you know, it was who lost China, and, well, we're going to ignore them. People may not remember we didn't recognize them and no membership in the UN right, just right. because it's a quarter or whatever the world's right. population. Where does, where does Nixon get the idea? How does he come to the conclusion that we have to open up to them? Not why, not, not, not the substance, but why does he come to that conclusion? Well, he, it's interesting. He writes it in a Foreign Affairs magazine article about a year or so before he becomes president. I didn't know that. Yeah, in which he says that he puts it in the future, sort of the distant future, it seems. But he says, someday the United States will have to come to terms with the People's Republic of China. It makes no sense in the long run for us not to have relations. So he's on record, and presumably the Chinese read that and saw that and had some interest in it at the time. So he, he's on record in publicly as thinking this. Now, why does he say this? Basically, he's a balance of power, realist person who believes you have to deal with the forces that exist in the world and make the best deal you can, that you, maybe that you balance them against one another. This sounds like Henry Kissinger. Yes, well, he, that's one of the reasons they were so compatible, was because they did have a very similar ideas as to how the world worked. They were both th saw themselves as hard-nosed realists, and they were. Now, Kissinger, of course, was Rockefeller's that's security right. advisor. That's right, and he had only met Nixon, I think, twice before he had had, uh, before he had what was a very funny meeting at the in Pierre Hotel, Hotel Pierre, yeah, yeah. in which Nixon was supposed to have offered him the job of national security advisor, but uh, he didn't. And uh, John Mitchell, Nixon's aide, calls up Kissinger and says, are you going to accept the job? And Kissinger says, what job? <laughs> <laughs> and Nixon says, national security advisor. Nixon says, I mean, Kissinger says, I didn't know I'd been offered it. <laughs> and so this is, I mean, this is just, Typical of Nixon's funny personal dealings. Fascinating. Let's turn to Jimmy Carter. Sure. Um, this is the man who, it is said, felt he had to decide who right. used the White House tennis courts. Right. So this is Mr. Detail Man. Mr. Detail Man. Yes. The engineer. Engineer. Also determined that he was going to make the decisions. Uh, he ran for president a little bit against Henry Kissinger. 
he said, for foreign policy, Mr. Ford, Henry Kissinger is the president of this country because he's running foreign policy, not you, Mr. President. He said that in the presidential debate. And so when he gets in, he says, no one person is going to dominate my administration other than me as president. And how does that affect um, the National Security Advisor, who by this time is Brzezinski? Right. Well, for one thing, he is determined to appoint Brzezinski, who had been a very important and influential campaign advisor, even though lots of people told him, uh, Mr. President, maybe you better think twice because this is a very, you know, he's a very bright but mercurial guy. He, people don't necessarily trust him. He might not manage the process very well. He's got and sharp so, elbows, no? He's got sharp elbows, sometimes seem to delight in giving people uh, trouble. And a Cold War hawk. And a Pole. Cold War hawk, a interestingly, in a president. I mean, it, it turns out that Brzezinski is probably the most hawkish member of this administration, and, and Carter himself is the most dovish, mm -hmm. with Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, and Harold Brown, the Secretary of Defense, somewhere in between. This does not sound like the model for success that you posit in the book. No, it's not the model for success. And what happens is the press early on seizes on the notion of disarray in the Carter administration. And this becomes something that, the, uh, that of course, drives Carter angry. Uh, a lot of press blames it on Brzezinski. Carter increasingly blames it on the State Department people he assumes are talking to the press and complaining about Brzezinski. And so uh, Carter then uh, gets less, you know, ends up reacting by reinforcing Brzezinski and uh, get, going farther away from the other people. Um, this is in some ways a, a disquieting story about not just Carter, but the personalities that seem to shape this. Um, let's go to the uh, George W. Bush. Okay. Where it seems from reading your book that his desire to be the decider yeah. strongly affects not just his relationship with the bureaucracy and the National Security Advisor, but seems to compromise the planning for both the war and the post-war period in Iraq. George W. Bush felt that the president should decide, stick to decisions, and therefore give people below him confidence to carry out the policy. He decides early after 9-11 to invade Afghanistan. Uh, the rest of his government, including uh, the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, get very antsy when after a month things don't seem to be going well. And Bush says, we have a plan, stick to the plan, and it works. And then suddenly the Taliban are defeated. So Bush gains confidence. He says, I made this basically as a gut decision. We had to go after them. I guys. hate gut decisions, but we'll let that one pass. That's what, uh, that's what, but that's what he says. He says, I'm a gut player. And so he then decides, for a range of reasons we don't all know really to this day, that we're going to go and overthrow Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Now that's never fully staffed out. Let's go back to the idea of a National Security Council or a State Department. Yeah. We don't have a, the a idea process. Is, right? Yeah, you're supposed to have a process where an issue like this gets, you look at the pros and cons, you get different people arguing different sides, you do a staff analysis. What, are, what does Iraq look like under alternative assumptions? How many troops do you need to win the to beat the Iraqi army? How many troops do you need to run the country to enforce security? And is it, is it really necessary? Is it urgent? Uh, does he really have nuclear weapons? If there's some danger of him having them, how do you, how, are there other ways of dealing with it? And so far as we know, and many reporters have spent many, many hours trying to find mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm. there was never a meeting on the Bush, George W. Bush White House on the specific question of whether one should launch an invasion of Iraq. There had been a whole planning process, or these questions were asked within state, correct? The state had a, had a post-war Iraq project on the assumption uh, that there was going to be a war. And the Pentagon, of course, had lots of plans about how you were going to invade Iraq, and which they kept coming in with more troops, and Rumsfeld kept saying, we don't need as many, cut it down, cut it down. So they were, they were clearly planning questions on details, but on the central question of whether you do it or not, they didn't. Let's, let's take a step, step back for a yeah. second, because here's what I hear you saying. The internal process didn't exist. Yeah. And I think many people have said, that there wasn't an external process either. The, 
that in the Congress, the Democrats who had been burned by um, uh, the first Iraq war, every one of the Democrats who, were planning, who was planning to run for president, except Barack Obama, voted in favor of the invasion. So there was nothing in the Congress to force the thinking. The media didn't force a, 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 a careful consideration of this. Uh, can this great nation of more than 300 million souls and Lord knows how many atomic bombs um, make these decisions? This is not about it's George scary. Bush. It's is scary. This? It's scary. But the one thing we tend to forget, because B George Bush left office not at all popular, but he was very popular in 2002. In the aftermath of the sense that he had responded effectively in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, and people were therefore politically scared. It wasn't just whether they'd been where they'd been in 1991, but it was where it was this very powerful president. I think it's hard to conceive of him invading Iraq had it not been for the sort of broad mandate he got from the 9/11 attacks and as our commander in chief. Interestingly, the people who ended up in opposition were his father's advisors. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brent Scowcroft writes an article: "Don't attack Saddam." is the headline in the summer of 2002. James Baker writes an article saying, don't attack him unless you've got a lot of allies. <laughs> and uh, so there was clearly a, uh, a sense among the sort of centrist Republican foreign policy establishment. That the realists, they call The realists, them. that's mm -hmm. right. And, uh, but uh, George W. was determined to do it. And again, he, he believed you make decisions and then you empower people to carry them out. You don't muck in the details. This also made it hard, uh, harder for his national security advisor. But Carter, because he mucked in details all the time, that meant issues were always coming to Brzezinski to staff to organize meetings for the president and so forth. Uh, the, uh, John F. Kennedy did lots of detailed stuff, and that meant Bundy uh, was, de was uh, George H.W. Bush was heavily involved in all the details, so, so that Scowcroft is staffing him does this. But George W. Bush doesn't, and that means, and, and, he, do and he also has a vice president who he has uh, lunch with regularly, who is, you know, has private conversations with him uh, with, as another channel. And his vice president also sits in on the planning meetings chaired by Rice. We have a few minutes. Uh, let me go to a topic that um, always um, leaves me with large questions. And this is Ronald Reagan. Yeah. He seems like almost a conundrum. Yeah. Um, but reading your book, I, I have the impression, then again, this is a little bit like Nixon, there are two sides, but that he was a commanding force in the end um, in world affairs. He was a commanding force in the sense that he presided over and articulated and inspired to a significant degree a major turning point in the world. As a day-to-day -day commander, he was essentially absent mm -hmm. in his government. Uh, when, he, uh, when the question was, what should be our position on arms control, and Secretary of State George Shultz said, we want to move ahead cautiously, and Caspar Weinberger, Secretary of Defense, said, not on your life. And the National Security Advisor tried to bring this to the president for the decision. The president said, I can't decide that. And I don't want to decide between Cap and George. They're both my friends. You guys work it out. And so you had stalemate on a lot of issues. Or you had, in the case of an ill-fated uh, sending of peacekeeping forces to, the, to Lebanon, you had a horrific attack which killed over 200 U.S. Marines because they were put as a sort of a bureaucratic compromise in a situation where they couldn't uh, do anything much and they were there as a symbolic presence. And so there were a lot of messes in the foreign policy messes and yet... And yet, yeah, and you yet say he, he noticed. You said, you say he, he was one of the first, Maggie Thatcher too. I yeah, well, when, yeah when Gorbachev comes in and begins to move things differently, Gor Maggie Thatcher said, this is a man I can do business with. And I don't know if Ronald Reagan said that, but he clearly felt that way. And, but he was very, uh, he and Margaret Thatcher were very we're close. close. That's right. That's and right. So yeah. And Bush and, and Reagan went far enough ahead so that a lot of the people who were, including probably the vice president, certainly people like Brent Scowcroft said, wait a minute, I don't think, you, you know, they've gone awful fast. And so he went farther, faster with Gorbachev than many of the people uh, in the sort of centrist establishment, Republican establishment thought was wise. And I think history has borne him out as being, being right on those things.
but as a but as a process person, he's a he's a it's a he's the only person who ever had six national security advisors. He's the only time that you really had a scandal, first rate scandal come out of the National Security Council staff that's supposed to be working for the president. So there's there are a lot of downsides in terms of how it for operates. For sure, for sure. Yeah, but you're right. It's a paradox. Um, uh, many of these presidents yeah, are right. paradoxes. Yeah, I mean, if you look at somebody like Bill Clinton. He comes in, actually like Reagan, saying, I want to do economics. I don't want to do the foreign policy. The other guys do foreign mm -hmm, policy. Mm -hmm. And there's messes because of that in both cases. Then Clinton, uh, earlier than Reagan, decides, I am going to take charge of foreign policy. And things get better. It's very hard to run foreign policy without the president. And particularly if you don't have a natural leader among the other senior officials in your administration. Well, that's a good lesson to end the program with. Mac Dessler, on behalf of... Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for being with us. Good luck with your book, In the Shadow of the Oval Office. I'll show it again because I think it's such a wonderful book. And to our viewing audience, thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Uh, if you want to write us a letter or email, I should say, it's policywatch at umd, that's umd for University of Maryland dot edu. And this is Doug Besheroff again saying thank you very much and see you soon. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.